The Modern Jeeper Show, the show about Jeeps, Jeeping, and Jeepers. Well, hey, Modern Jeepers, it's another episode of The Modern Jeeper Show with me, Matson from Metal Cloak, and Mr. Modern Jeeper, Corey Osborne. Hey, buddy. Hey, and Rockstar Jeep Girl Jesse. What's going on, Matson? Oh man, not a lot. Like it's it's been sunny out here. It's, and it's kind of here. funny because we have the International Sportsman's Expo that we do. And we do that. Mm -hmm. We've been doing it every year until COVID hit and they didn't do it. And then 21, they still wanted to do it, but they required all the COVID restrictions and you had to be vaccinated. So we still didn't do it. Then uh, 22, it kind of came around, but it was for whatever reason, there were still problems. We didn't do it. And then we were going to do it this year. We're all set to do it. They wanted to put us in a different location, which probably would have been a good location. But looking at the weather map, like and this was just two weeks ago, looking at it, it was supposed to be raining, 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 raining all through. And we're like, uh, that, that's a miserable event to be outside with and have all that rain pouring down. And you've got to get staffing issues because we got to have like three or four people there. And we generally pull from the production and we get this rotating staff to do it. And it was beautiful three days. It was just sun was out, beautiful, but we didn't do it. We we canceled out. We decided not to do it, and, and, and it was the weather was great, but that's we fine. That's well, fine. yeah, we had, um, you know, we were <laughs> we so we've been home one day. Uh, we were gone for about three. We left around the fourth of January, and just got home day before yesterday. And uh, we were out in St. George area, out at Sand Hollow, um, in the Hurricane, uh, Utah, uh, for the event, and it was a good event. Um, you know, it is interesting though. We we had weather. We had yeah. lots of weather, and um, it was miserably cold. In fact, we had some mornings that were 24, 25 degrees. Oh my god! And that's typically not a fair weather type of jeeper event. Um, they they you could tell turnout definitely. I think um, mm -hmm. I think they had a good turnout, but there were a lot of people that really just I think stayed, stayed home, stayed stayed away. Um, we had a couple of decent days, but man, as soon as the cold, sun went down, cold, it was cold. pretty miserable. Like we were running the trailer and it was literally 32 degrees outside. Um, that's least, a first. Yeah. You know how hard it is to run the CTI trailer buttons in big in giant hands. ski gloves? Or when your hands are frozen solid. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's really it's really interesting. You got to do it elbows. You got to do elbow down. <laughs> yeah, right? Yeah. yeah. Up, it was and down and up and down. No. <laughs> and then you don't even want to talk to anybody. But it's like, Get up here. You know what, Here's your paperwork. Go. Yeah, just next. Um, no, and actually, we had a really good group. Mm -hmm. um, the people that that were out at the uh, the vendor show. I think there was some miscommunication this year, just because they have that year. Th this event has grown uh, over the last few years, and they've tried to split it up into two locations, out into a, a place where they called Stucky Farms, which is about 13 miles from where yeah. the where the uh, the arena is, where we're typically set up. And uh, I think people were confused. The weather was really bad on Wednesday and Thursday, which they had planned to have um, things going on out at this other venue. Uh, and people just, I think- Snow, rain, mud. Said no. Um, so there were still some people going out there going, hey, where's everybody at? Uh, but the reality of it is the, the vendor show was, was Thursday and Friday down where it typically is where registration is and stuff. And, and it, it was good. I mean, they always take really good care of us um, as far as our location. Um, we have to be outside, uh, of course, with the trailer. But um, people were pretty respectful. Sometimes we get the the haters, you know, hey, can you be here at six o'clock in the morning? Because I'm going to go run trails. And yeah, that's not, not going to work. <laughs> Sorry, our, our, the equipment doesn't work at 6 a.m. Yeah, it no. has a timer. It's only allowed to work. It um, <laughs> has to be at least 9 o'clock in the morning. Right, right. has to at least have three cups of coffee before it starts working. Yes, yes. Uh, new well, you know, I, think we need, I think that's the next setup for the trailer is you need to have some sort of jet heater that just kind of blows out towards yeah, it. Put it. We'll put it in an outdoor tent. There yes. you go. I like that's it. That's not a bad I idea. Like need, I, I'll approve that a budget. No problem. <laughs> well the new generator yeah, that works. would actually work no matter everywhere you even a, even a hot place you could put in an outdoor tent and have ac inside. and then have cooling yeah then nobody would leave well there's that too. keep everybody in that's fine we'll sit and talk to people that's funny the, the that's new funny. the new generator worked out well 
Um, no, no <laughs> issues there. It doesn't struggle nearly as much as the other one did. And we um, got a little bit more lift out of the scissors too. Yeah. Interestingly, really? enough, yeah. um, I can get full travel out of the, uh, I think the new, new it's 1370. I, yeah. 1370. I got another half an inch out of one of the scissor lifts. I think the other generator just wasn't strong enough to lift at, at that, that little that last little bit. Height. Yeah. Cause what is it like 32 inches? Is that the, is yeah. that the max yeah. height? Yep. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Wow. Well, that's cool. That's cool. So everybody gets to experience it. That'll be nice this year be able to do that and get out to all those events. Well, cool. So you're back. You're enjoying yourself. What's next on the agenda? Oh, man. So Jesse's been working on the uh, event calendar on the website and trying to get all of our events up onto the modernjeeper.com website, which uh, those are slowly getting populated, uh, taking some of the event requests, putting them in there. Um, really, we I this morning I worked on the finishing uh kind of requirements for our national parks permit for Death Valley. So uh, my friends at, at the National Park Service out there, uh, there was a couple remaining things. And I'd been kind of hesitant because I didn't have um, both trips fully planned. And as part of my permitting process, uh, for each trip, I have to set forth kind of a tentative itinerary. So mm. kind of seeing where roads were going to open and because of the flash flooding they've had, uh, finished that this morning. So really the next event for us is, is Death Valley. Uh, we have quite a number of projects to get done because mm. I think Jesse's JL, uh, Funshine, will be uh, the, tr the Jeep that we take out there, which oh, really? we haven't okay. had it to Death Valley. So it's, yeah, yeah, you haven't really had it. You, you, you know, it's a whole new system you have to create. Yeah. Because you guys have, <laughs> you guys have like the system and these routine. I've, I've witnessed this firsthand, guys, with the JT that he has the routine they have where everything's at it's all set up right they can be unloaded and loaded back up like 15 minutes or less they have the routine down so yeah. this is a whole new like taking the 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 jl you got to rebuild this routine how are you well, going to get like the diatomic or the the the, the refrigerator in there and all of, i right. mean that's this it's going to be interesting and i'm surprised that i think how much less storage capacity we will have uh, going to the JL from the Gladiator. You know, that's one of the nice things about the Gladiator. You have that whole bed. You can just kind of cram stuff in there all over the place, and it's it's fine, especially with our, um, our ARS rack in there. You really can have it securely stowed, whereas the JL, things kind of pretty much got to be inside the rig, except, mm. of course, for the tent and whatnot. But we're going to figure it out. Well, and then you can do it if you, if you put your tent towards to the front. You can put the tent towards the front or tent towards the back. And you could put a couple of the stealth platforms right um, up there in the front, so you can have more strap down storage on top yeah. if you need it. I think we're yeah. gonna. I, I think we may need to do that. We'll end up having a box or something up on top of it, just stuff that we don't necessarily need all the time. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, we'll 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 make it work. We have some. We have some. Well, there's nothing to do outside. We have to be in the garage. So <laughs> yeah. Some tricks up your sleeve. Yeah. Yeah. Excellent. Well, I'll be I, I'm going to be joining you on that trip. I think Aaron is going to be joining you on that trip. Um, mm -hmm. I will be doing TDS the uh, the weekend oh, before, cool. or the days before. Literally, the TDS is the second or the third, fourth, and fifth. It's our 60th annual. Unfortunately, TDS of today is not the TDS of old. Um, okay. It's still a fun time out there because you just have all that, but not they don't they're not doing any organized tra uh, trails, and they do have a building they purchased across the way from the Chevron. Um, that or they didn't purchase, but one of their vendors did. Um, that will have the vendors or the CTI and all that stuff. So we'll do that. The I think the third and fourth, and then I'll take off the afternoon of the fourth and head out to uh, to catch you guys. And I'll bring I'll be bringing Joshua with me. So cool. then we'll do that to a spring trip. And I love the fact that I have to take my kids so that I have to go. It's like getting me out, right? Yeah, this right. It's it's gonna make you go. Yeah, right. I'm actually going on a wheeling trip for the first part of the year. What do you know? <laughs> awesome. Well, that's cool. That's cool. Well, you know, um, we can dive right into uh, the real reason we're doing this episode, not just because it's episode 202, but because we have a great guest. And uh, Corey, this, yeah, this, is, this guest this is a is, friend of yours. So I'm going to go ahead and yeah, let this you do is the introduction. A, this is a great segue um, talking about uh, overlanding is, is I, I, I met this uh, gentleman uh, on an overlanding trip. We were back east in, in West Virginia. And um, you know, it's kind of funny. I, I, that trip was actually a mile star event. That was one of the XBDN trips. And uh, talking about overlanding, when I first met this guy, I had no idea who he was really. Um, we, everybody, there was a variety of rigs. 
and uh, and he'll have to correct me because I may be wrong, but I believe it was a blazer mm -hmm. and a K5 blazer and it didn't have a top on the back. And I remember the first night we got to this campground and it was pouring down rain. And this guy is in a K5. There's nothing in this K5 blazer, no top on. He, he gets to the campground. He parks right near us. He gets out a 10 by 10 easy up and puts it over the back of his blazer and throws a, a real mattress, not a, not a blow up mattress. This is like a mattress you'd find in your house on a bed. He throws that in the back. He's, he's ready to go. And I'm thinking to myself, man, we're over here on the ground uh, trying to set up a tent in the <laughs> rain and we're trying to get our mattress situated. He's done and, and he's totally like just thrilled. Um, such, a, such a really, really great guy, it turns out. And he also happens to be state senator in West Virginia. Uh, welcome, Mr. Mark Maynard. Thank you, Corey. I'm flattered and honored that you would ask me to be on the show tonight. I'll, I'll tell you a little bit more about that Blazer. It was a big block Chevy with long tube headers and a cam, and, and it's the first time I'd ever overlanded in it. I've got quite a few rigs, as some of us do, with this uh, disease kind of uh, loving four-wheel drives, and so <laughs> I couldn't make up my mind which one to take, really, and some of them are more reliable than others, so uh, at the last minute, I decided to take that blazer and so i had to figure out a way i could uh, camp in it so that was my solution so <laughs> well it That's was awesome. i tell you what it was pretty cool for us to be out there in the middle of this in this field on a hillside but it's pouring down rain and um you know we i don't know i look back at that now and i'm like man we're really bougie out here in our in our, <laughs> our overlanding rigs with these rooftop tents and all this now and okay. and it's kind of it makes me kind of revert back and go you know what we really don't need all those things to get outside and enjoy mm -hmm. uh, so many places in our country. Uh, and, and, and I will say that, uh, you know, in California, there would be a state senator out here that'd be caught dead um, being, being as, as true to life as you are. I don't care what side of the aisle they're on. Somehow they get into it and they, they get this idea that, that life is all about being bougie and not about being real. And some of the, the good guys out here are long gone, unfortunately. So my hat's off to you, uh, as Senator, for for being uh, real and down to earth. I've watched some of the videos you've done too, talking about um, about land and land use and, and the fight you've done out there. And I definitely want to talk more about about that and about how you became a state senator and about uh, about your history with the state. But let's get back to the vehicles because this K5 Blazer, what year was it? 74. 74. Okay. So I had a 90, I had a 92, which was the last year of that body style with the, with the good old steel, steel dash and, you know, yeah. and the seats and the back that came off the back. Um, I had that one for I have five years, ran it through three transmissions. I mean, it was a, it was a fun rig, but, um, how, do you still have that rig? I do. Yeah. I still have it. Nice. Now, In addition to many others, <laughs> I was going to say, okay, so, so Maynard Motors, Let's talk Maynard Motors. So how did that start? Was that your dad's business, your business? How, how did that whole world and how did you become a gearhead? Let's let's just it go It actually uh, started out with my dad. Uh, my grandparents had a grocery store and gas station. And so he took an interest in cars. He was born in 1938 and uh, he started working on cars when he was 10. And as part of the family business, he kind of was beside up there and had, uh, had a car lot. And he worked on uh locals cars and has salvage yard and, and moved to the location where I'm at now in 1967 and I was born in 72 uh, across the street from a Union 76 service station that he built and so I grew up in that gas station every day we had two full service pumps and I did a lot of gas pumping for the customers and uh, my my dad got involved in a local four-wheel drive club in about 1976 I was four years old and my parents always took me and my sister everywhere they went. So, and this was a really professional club for 1976. It was incorporated uh, with secretary, treasurer, president, and wow. uh, we had weekly club meetings and weekly trail rides, which is a big <laughs> weekly, uh, big, yeah, big agenda. And uh, so this was like an extended family. The name of the club was the original Ridge Runners. And I don't know how the name came about, but, my dad did that for about four years and they started, he started attending a uh, local four wheel drive race, somewhat local in Cincinnati, Ohio. 
and it was sanctioned by the East Coast Four Wheel Drive Association. And they were the racing uh, segment of the East Coast Four Wheel Drive Association. So uh, he ended up building a, a dra sand drag truck, started racing there in 1980, and ran pretty seriously for about five years. So uh, from age eight to uh, 13 or 14, I was around at just the perfect age. So sand drag racing is near dear to my heart, as well as the East Coast Four Wheel Drive Association, which probably a lot of your listeners and viewers have never heard of. It's uh, uh, they did a lot and was a big deal. They also handled trail riding, so uh, they're kind of near and dear to my heart. But so that's kind of how I grew up. And then as I got my driver's license, I didn't even think about it. You know, I ended up uh, always loved four wheel drives. Uh, my first. What, what you were? What? How old were you when you got your license? Sixteen. And how long have you been driving before you got your license? <laughs> About. Probably seven or eight years. <laughs> yeah, that's what I think. Yeah. By myself, like we had a hay field near our uh, 76 station, and I was in elementary school, and my dad bought a 64 Plymouth four door automatic slant six for $75, and somehow it became mine. And it was red and blue, so I painted a 43 on the door. And uh, <laughs> I, I wonder if Ken Block, God rest his soul, picked the number 43 because of Richard Petty. But I know I did as a kid, <laughs> you know, and, you know, Ken um, was 55. So mm. and Richard Petty was a big deal, you know, when I was a kid. So I wonder if that's why he picked the number 43. But anyway, uh, you know, we lost our industry, lost the great showman. So, um Absolutely. Space skin block. But uh, so I drove that car around in, in grade school and my mom and dad weren't even watching me or anything. I was like eight years old <laughs> down there in my 64 Plymouth making laps in the hay field. So <laughs> that's how it all started. Wow. That's awesome. That's awesome. Yeah. And so we have a little bit of simpatico here because I grew up in gas stations. My dad was a, was an old, you know, old time mechanic ran several gas stations up and down the state and the Chevron mainly was his. And then he owned one in the early eighties for a few years until his partner kind of screwed him out of some things. And, mm. and he had to let that go because mobile mm. said, yeah, we're not going to play this game. And they wanted the piece of property. So they, they found a way to get it, but that was it. You know, growing up around the stations, going up around the cars and growing yeah. up and, and doing the, the full service, even when it wasn't full service, you know, taking care of people. It's also where I learned how to sell. I could sell, I could sell anybody an air filter. I'll tell you that. <laughs> um, but that's interesting. That's, you know, the whole selling thing, gas stations, hmm. um, politician now. So, yeah, huh. <laughs> big circle there. Yeah. Well, you know, it's all about communication, right? And you, that's you right. Very quickly learn when you're in an environment where you grow up around people, you, you learn how to communicate. And yeah. if, you, if, if you don't have that basic fundamental skill, you know, it's, it makes it much harder in life. So, okay. So you, so you, you got your, your Plymouth and then that was your car for how long? You know, probably a, a year or two. And then I got yeah. a Mustang too. And then I got a Falcon and just, you know, I don't Mustang too, really? Yeah. It was a, <laughs> well, it was a four cylinder, uh, four speed. So, uh, I had <laughs> did some clutch dumping in that little car so <laughs> it had been rolled over and and the windshield was kind of cracked up a little bit it was a light rollover so i could still still have some fun in it <laughs> <laughs> that's awesome that's awesome when did you get your so when did you get your first four-wheel drive probably when i was about 19 or 20 it was a 78 bronco with a, a six inch lift and q78s on 10 inch wheels and they ended up being about 36s uh, it was kind of like a, it was a four wheel RVT was the name of the tire. And uh, I did some wheeling in it and uh, nothing super hardcore, but then I sold it, flipped it kind of, and uh, made some money on it and bought a 79 Bronco. And um, I went off roading one time. I had 38s and open dips front and rear with 350 gears and 351 modified. And there was a pretty bad rock obstacle in front of me. And I was following an XJ with 34s and a welded rear diff. Mm. And I could not make it through this obstacle. And that XJ with 34s went right over it. And that day I started looking for me a Jeep. And uh, <laughs> so I started liking the ZJs because of the four pole suspension. 
And so I found me a 98 5.9 ZJ at the salvage pool that was wrecked. It was a light rollover. So it already had some character to it. And uh, so I put lockers in both ends, 35, six inches of lift. And it's a capable little rig. It's not like my dream vehicle, but uh, it's served its purpose well. Uh, so, so how many vehicles do you currently have in your, in your quote unquote fleet? Well, as far as, are you counting the ones that run or the ones that don't? <laughs> <laughs> how many are there in, let's, let's go, let's go down. There. How many are there in total? How many projects do you actually care about? And uh, how many are just sitting there because, well, it got dropped off one day and maybe I'll get to it. Yeah. Well, I'll name off my significant ones. I've got a, a 71. I'm going to mention some cars here that aren't four-wheel drive, but they're near yeah, yeah. my heart. I've got a 71 Chevelle that I drove to high school in red primer, 454, four-speed, 12-volt, uh, 410 posi rear end. And, and I still have it, and I drove to high school, and I've restored it and put it back, kind of original resto mod. Um, I've got a, a fast street strip car with uh, two stages of nitrous. It's an 82 Monte Carlo. Uh, 355 small block Chevy 202 heads and um, a bunch of other goodies um, with my as far as my four wheel drives go I have a, um, a 80 model CJ5 Laredo with 39.5 18 boggers and a small block mm -hmm. Chevy and fender well headers and a big rowdy cam it's kind of like my gold wing <laughs> I just use it to boulevard cruise in and I've not had the full top on it since 99 just bikini top so if the weather isn't isn't good enough for a bikini top or no top it sits in the garage but, all you need uh, to do is, is search for uh mark maynard uh and maynard um motors and one of the pictures that pops up is that cj i've got it right here on my screen right now oh really what's up with a with a beautiful blonde lady in the passenger seat uh oh well <laughs> I, didn't <know. laughs> I didn't know that picture was out there but uh, <laughs> that's my <name> to <laughs> Uh, but yeah, it's a, and you're uh, you're in front of some old looks like an old gas station or something or old. Yeah, that's near place. my house, and now that building is gone. Someone tore it down, oh. so I was glad I got to kind of document that building. Oh, nice, nice. Well, that's a good looking rig, man. Looks like fun. So, um, so keep going, keep going. Didn't mean to interrupt the flow. Oh wow, you know, uh, I just bought a, a forty model Buick Street Rod the other day, and I can build stuff myself, but I just don't have any time, and and uh, so that's a fun vehicle. I bought one new car in my life and it was a 2015 scat pack challenger rt <laughs> shaker six feet like yeah, it's better it's lime green <laughs> <laughs> nice that's awesome so, uh, and i still have it and i'll probably i'll probably never sell it that way i don't lose money on it <laughs> <laughs> You're right what 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 um what is your daily driver right now like what do you what do you go to the office with you know, I'll sound a little bougie, but it's kind of off my car lot. I've got a, a 05 BMW 545 V8 six speed, four door, which mm. is a fun car to drive and gets decent mileage. And it's kind of like my beater, you know. <laughs> so uh, I leave my Challenger in the garage, you know, during uh, rainy days and stuff. That's funny. That's awesome. Yeah. His beater car is a BMW. Yeah, no big deal. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But it's an old 2005. So. Nice. Well, so, okay, last so, trip he was driving an Xterra. So that's true. Yeah, well, I still have yeah. it. It served me well. That was kind of a last minute overlanding rig too, and it, it served me so well. I had mm -hmm. a set of thirty one ten fifty IROX, and I mounted them on that Xterra and had an instant trail rig overlanding rig. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That that was actually one of Jerry Bain's trips, and uh, again, uh, after after being out in West Virginia and and spending some time out there, especially with you and and. And the Baines and, and his whole group, um, I had to go back. And I, I think we're going to try and get back that, out there again uh, this year. But, um, you know, you and him spend a whole lot of time together, uh, kind of him helping you, you helping him kind of do a lot of the um, the road issues that you guys are having in in uh, West Virginia. And uh, talk, talk a little bit about that. Well, Jerry came up here to the Capitol one time to meet about some trail issues and we became friends and that's probably been six or seven years ago. And since then our relationship has uh, got better. And uh, Corey, I want to thank you and Jesse for coming out all the way to West Virginia. That's not really close to, to where you live and uh, appreciate you seeing what great opportunities are here for. It's a beautiful wheeling. state. So, yeah. Well, it's, a beautiful state. it's amazing. Um, just, well, the state itself, I don't think uh, folks that have never, that live out West, 
Um, they know it's green back back east, but they don't really understand what is available um, as far as not only just tourism, but um, off the beaten path and history and and the beauty of being back east. And a lot of other states are now paying a lot of attention to you to kind of going, hey, we'd like some of those dollars. Well, what do we need to do in our state? And But you guys are, are doing you're having to do a lot of rework on these roads and trails that have existed. You know, out here in the West, we, we, uh, we talk about um, the, 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 whether it's wilderness areas or whatever the BLM and whatever the forest servicers are doing, they're very on top of it. And I th always thought it was interesting that in West Virginia, you guys have a ton of roads out there, but it, it's, and, and people in the West probably don't understand how difficult it is to get into a lot of these areas. These are very, very dense wooded areas with lots of roads. And there's not a lot of um, enforcement or I mm -hmm. guess a policing of, you know, if somebody yeah. buys a bunch of land, they're going to either turn it into a mining operation or a gravel pit or, or whatever. And they just kind of do what they want until somebody tells them that they are in the wrong, I guess. Yeah, and you know, a lot of those roads you're talking about, if you live out west, you're not, you can't really plan your trip here. And so one of my goals and Jerry's goals with the Country Roads Coalition and others in the group are just wanting to, to put West Virginia on a map. So if you lived in the Midwest or all the way in the West, to look at some type of uh, way to identify the type of travel you want to do, whether it's hardcore wheeling or just a backcountry dirt road and go from one side of the state to the other and have a place that you can count on for lodging or overlanding a, with a campsite for dispersed camping. And uh, since I became appointed chairman of the uh, new outdoor recreation committee, the Senate president wanted me to concentrate on land access, land access use and motorsports was another passion of mine. And uh, the session started about two weeks ago and it's just been a thrill. And this is like, it couldn't be a better time for this uh, podcast. Nice. So, so you mentioned well, motorsports because uh, um, I want to dig into a little bit of your like hot rodding time. Mm -hmm. Like you were, uh, you were involved in, um, in funny cars, if I understand. Is that correct? I was. And, you know, it's a chapter of my life that I rank up there with being a state senator. Mm. Um, believe it or not, uh, I was cylinder head guy and bottom end guy for uh, Jim Head's Nitro Funny Car from 06 to 2010. And it was just, such an amazing experience to be out there with Connie Coletta and Don Perdome and Kenny Bernstein, John Force, all the names that I had and, and people I'd seen on TV and in magazines for all my life. And I was there in the staging lane with them. And uh, it's just a pleasure to, to work on that car and be a part of that. How did you get involved in that? You know, I'd gone through a divorce in 2005 and I turned the TV on it. And I don't know if you all know this, but it, it's hard to catch the live drag racing on TV, or at least the day of. And I happened to see, um, you know, drag race on TV. And I saw Jim Head doing a burnout. I was a fan of Jim Head's in 1983. And I couldn't believe it. He was still out there racing a funny car with no sponsor. And I knew he's from Columbus. I thought, you know what? I'm going to try to get a job with him. So back then, it was kind of tough to track someone down on the internet. I finally found someone that worked for him's home phone number. <laughs> Called home phone number. He gave me the office number. Called, talked to Jim. Jim said, send me a resume. I sent a resume and the online, uh, the over the phone interview was, which way do you turn a bolt to loosen it? And uh, <laughs> I told him left. I told him left unless it's left handed threads. And I guess that was the right thing to say. So uh, <laughs> uh, a month and a half later, he said, you want to fly to Atlanta? And I did for five years. I, I'm still caught on the back that you called somebody, you randomly found somebody's phone number, called them at home. <laughs> Yeah, it was the only the only person I could find. I knew he had a contracting company, but it's like I guess that's just the way we used to do it, right? You know, nowadays it's like, well, I I, I got to find an email for them, or I got to find a number on their LinkedIn account. I, I don't want to I don't want to bother them with a phone call, or <laughs> right? It's like, you know, it's first it's just give the guy a call, call him at home. Hi. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's only I had to do it. That's awesome. So five years. That's awesome. That's great. That's great. Now, so during that time, you're you're was Maynard Motors still going like your dad's company was going and you were just, you were just off doing this or was it all part of the, it kind of was, the same I thing? Was, 
I was lucky enough to be a fly-in guy. So I would drive to Columbus on uh, Friday morning, fly with Jim and about three or four other crew members to wherever the race was. Sometimes I fly commercial and I was back home Sunday night. So uh, my uh, mom and dad, I would let them watch my business while I was gone. And uh, so I didn't really put it on the back burner too much until I got elected in the Senate. Now, <laughs> <laughs> did you put, so were you actually sponsoring his car too? Did you throw a little, little tag on the outside of his car? You know, uh, actually when I ran for the Senate in 2008, uh, I had Maynard for Senate on his funny car in Vegas. <laughs> so uh, That's awesome. Yeah. I, That's I great. I was unsuccessful, but in 2014, I did a little three race gig with a guy by the name of John Bojek from Cleveland and it was his first year in Nitro Funny Car. And uh, I had a little interview with a uh, national dragster and uh, ended up winning. I, I flew the red eye home from Vegas on Sunday night, campaigned Monday, won Tuesday, and then went to Pomona as the right, right hand, right hand guy on the funny car as Senator elect. <laughs> so, <laughs> Uh, no, 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 no. Don't let him touch the grease. He's a senator elect. <laughs> <laughs> uh, sir, can we help you help us? That's that's great. Well, I, I, you know, in LA, I used to when I was a kid. I had one of one of my my mom's boyfriends or whatever it was. Um, you know, used to take us out to the drags, and that was that was just a, an amazing, amazing experience when you're just you know nine, ten years old, and you know you're doing this but it's oh, awesome yeah. right and oh, yeah. and it just it, those were all i've always loved it and we've had a few friends in fact when we, our first shop here um which was about two miles from where we're currently at was two thousand square feet next to us was a guy who had a he was a construction business but his his offices like he didn't even need his office he had a small little office to operate his construction business out of the reason that he had a shop there next to us two thousand square feet was just to park his rig for his dragster so right. he had a you know, funny car that he'd pull out and, and uh, go do it. And that's what he did on the weekends. Like that's how he got, that was his therapy. Go out, yeah. race 200 miles an hour, <laughs> come back home, put it away, go out and do some races, come back home. And it was interesting because at that time you could have, you'd just be sitting there doing some work and all of a sudden da, 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 you're right. And there was another, there was oh. another shop next to us that built dragsters. And so it was wow. fun. I mean, it's like almost as fun as hearing, we're right near Mather Air Force Base or what used to be Mather Air Force Base. And you'd hear a plane fly overhead and you go, oh, wow, what's that? Same thing with the cars. It's like, oh, man, what's that? I got to go see. I got to drop everything I'm doing and run out there and take a look at what's 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 running. It's an addiction. Yep. So then, so what year did you run? You So you ran originally in 2000, um, 2008. 2008, unsuccessfully. Okay. Okay. And then ran. And, so why? Why did you why did you want to go and uh, and do this? What, what was the impetus to become a politician? Well, my grandfather was involved in politics and my aunt and my uncle on my mom's side were involved, but I didn't really see any of that. But my mom and dad were always involved and I went to the campaign headquarters as a kid and attended a few meetings in 2004 and the chairman had left abruptly. And I guess they liked what I had to say. And I was appointed as chairman of this little county executive committee and uh, I, I would help candidates um, run like went for, for election and also I'd recruit candidates. And so mm -hmm. through that process, I ended up uh, finding out about a vacancy on the ballot in 2008. I ran unsuccessfully, but it was a great experience. It was fun. I thought someday again, you know, I'd like to run. And uh, I was encouraged to run in 2014 against a 32 year incumbent, longest serving Senator in the history of West Virginia. Wow. And, I beat him by 389 votes out of 22,000 votes cast. So, uh, close race, but it's been fun. Yeah, I saw that. I saw that was, that was a nail biter for sure. <laughs> yeah. But that, but you came back, you know, was it four, is it four year term? Yeah, four years. For, just, for Senate, and then you have, you have your version, you have your assembly, I take it, your you know, version of the house that's two year terms. Yes, exactly. Okay. Um, and then so you did the four year term. So you, but that margin was much wider when you ran for reelection. So yeah, yeah, I'm just yeah, I was now re yeah, just was reelected to my third term. So uh, nice. happy, happy the voters. Uh, I think <laughs> I still have. I think I still have some. Uh, yeah, we do. It's right there. I was gonna say. I, I think on my I still desk. Still have my here. flag too. I nice. Oh, you nice. Know, Corey, a, a patch. That's cool. On, I plan on putting Velcro on the back of those so we can make headliner patches out of them. There you go. <laughs> there you go. That's awesome. 
that's awesome. And I, I do love the then the Maynard, of course, that same kind of NASCAR esque um, <laughs> yeah. uh, mm-hmm. Maynard there. Plus, which you which is right out of Maynard's Motors. I mean, the branding is just well done. Well done. <laughs> Actually, the logo that Corey has there is also kind of a subtle tribute to Evil Knievel, if you'll notice. Mm. <laughs> oh, Hold I did again, immediately Corey. when I saw him. I'm like, I'm oh, like... that's awesome. Right, <laughs> right. So you guys got to watch the YouTube channel to see what he's holding up because I'm not going to describe it to you. <laughs> Just go watch it on YouTube. YouTube YouTube.com slash Modern Jeeper. Check us out. All the all the episodes are up there. Well, okay, so you get into the Senate. Now, um, from the beginning, obviously, and I, I just going to get a bit general idea because being in California and I used to work um, with a couple of organizations. One was the, it was called government technology. And so we did annual events um, with government agencies across the country. And it was always interesting for me because I worked a lot in politics in California. Now in California, when you have a, you call up a state Senator, you don't get a chance to talk to the state Senator. You call, you call and you talk to his, maybe his office manager. He probably has three or four staff. I mean, even the lowest guy has like four staffers, right? Yeah. He's got his office manager. He's got his legislative director. He's got his campaign manager who now works for you. Know, they, they're all they're all there, political director, whatever. Um, and then I had this opportunity to do an event in, in uh, I think it was North Carolina. It was a North Carolina Inter- International Intergovernmental Summit on, on Y2K or something. And we did this and I call up the guy's office and I said, um, the, this is the one who was sponsoring us doing the event. I said, yeah, I'll just send it over to your secretary. And he looked at me like, like the secretary son, I got a lady comes in once a week and does some typing for me. So just send it to me. Right. <laughs> so it, it was a re cause this, I was in my twenties. It was a redirection of my mind, understanding the rest. So what's it like being the legislator in, in West Virginia? Like how often do you guys meet? Um, what's, what, what's it like out there? Do you have staff or, or not? Yeah, you know, so West Virginia meets for 60 days straight once a year between the middle of January and the middle of March. And uh, we don't work always on Saturdays or Sundays, but sometimes we do. And uh, I've got an administrative assistant that kind of answers the phone for me and sets up meetings. And I have at my discretion my committee counsel, who's an attorney that helps me with bills that presents them to my committee. And uh a couple interns and a, uh, a clerk that runs the, uh, some of the operations of the committee. You know, I've got quite a few people at my disposal, but really only one that is in my office that's here to answer phone calls and, and organize things for me. And right now it looks like you have, what is this, five, nine pieces of legislation that you've, um, are these all ones that you've authored for this year, or is this like some of that's your co-sponsoring? Yeah, probably some that I'm co-sponsoring as well. I've got a bunch of bills ready to introduce, but I have a meeting tomorrow with the DNR to I have found over the, the past that I need to kind of get the DNR's approval on things instead of just trying to ram the bill through. If I can work out a compromise ahead of time, then that makes it a lot easier to get the legislation through. Play, playing the game. DNR for our listeners, that's the Department of National Resources? Yes, okay. yes. And um, which you referenced in a video, which we will link, um, I'll make sure we have a link on there, the video that Justin Korg actually sent over to me where you guys were out there with Dr. What was his name? Brian Holmes. Brian. Do- Dr. Brian Holmes about um, some of the trail work being done. And I also found it interesting. What it, one of the things you brought up, which would never, ever, ever happen out here is, um, is uh, jet skis on, on, on the rivers and creeks. Like that would be fun. <laughs> like, like, yeah, baby. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm actually that's on my agenda tomorrow to speak with the DNR about it. They regulate our streams and waterways, so I'm going to ask them. You know, so <laughs> that would be fun. That would be fun. Now, do you guys have the kind of restrictions out here like we do in Lake Tahoe as far as um, two-stroke engines? Right, there's lots of other regulations as to what can actually go into the waterways, or do you guys pretty? No, open there's on? no pick on wood. No, and I don't want everybody to hear about it. But uh, there's no regulations as far as type of internal combustion engine goes. Mm-hmm. Well, that's nice. Yeah. Go back east, just actually enjoy things. And yeah. Well, you know, try. And when, when we were out there um, on that first trip, that was when we also, we were at a, uh, we were at a state park, I believe. And we had some other folks, uh, I think it was the Department of Fishing Game, maybe were with us. And it was, it was the DNR. It was the DNR. Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, and it was so, 
from my perspective, again, living in the West and uh, Colorado is, is similar, but it's not like California where I, I, everything is so separate, but being out there with you and the resources that were brought to us, a bunch of guys in, in four wheel drive vehicles sitting at a campground. And here comes these pretty powerful folks in, in my, from my perspective and, and people who really, they, they wanted to see who we were and, and mm -hmm. how we acted and, and what kind of mentality we had, because there's this, this vision of, Oh, you guys are out there in your rigs, just tearing up the land mm -hmm. and destroying things. And here, these folks from the DNR were so excited and, and so willing to share and have conversations if we had questions and just to get to spend some time with each other and kind of go, they were like, hey, you guys aren't that bad. Like, you're pretty respectful. And I, that was kind of shocking uh, for them, I think. But what a good thing. And that just doesn't take place in other parts of the country. Yeah, that was the actual director of the DNR, like the top person in the whole state. And his uh, name was Director Stephen McDaniel. And he has since retired. But uh, we've got another good director in here. His name is uh, Director Brett McMillan. And he's a dirt bike guy. So, uh he seems to be pretty easy to work with, but he still has to manage manage all uh, all the regulations and everything. But uh, you know, he's a pleasure. Hmm. Cool. How how much do you get as far as the the other side of the aisle and, and uh, the environmentalists trying to shut things down? Is that a, is that a big? I mean, West Virginia. It's not too far from Virginia. It's not too far from D.C. and some powerful groups that have nothing better to do. Um, so, how, how much do you fight that in West Virginia? Again, I'm going to knock on wood, but since I became chairman of the Outdoor Recreation Committee, they've been knocking on my door. And mm. uh, so there have been about five or six through here, and they're telling me that they want to work with me. And uh, so, you know, we'll see. And then they hand, me their legislative, they hand me their legislative priorities, and the top thing is prevent off-roading on public land. <laughs> <laughs> We want to work with you as long as you're working with us, right? Yeah. yeah. Well, yeah, we they're also working with um, the hunters. They have an association there. They're having the same issues as they are with off-roading on the country back roads. Yep. Mm -hmm. So they wanted to partner with them so they could collaborate and have two fronts. So right. that's kind of cool. Yeah. yeah. That's cool. Yeah. The, the environmentalists, you know, we, we kind of, we fight them constantly. You got to fight them in the courts, but it's good that you, what they see is they all of a sudden saw this new committee and they went, Oop, Oh, and now I can go back and report that I've been meeting with the committee chair of, yeah. the, of the outdoor <laughs> right. recreation committee. Yeah. And they can, and then they send that out to all of their donor base and then they get a bunch of donations coming in to help support yeah. their, the agenda of their organization. So they all can continue to get their salaries for the next year. Yeah. Yeah. It's a, it's or, a or they game. see the they see the creation of this outdoor recreation committee and they get really excited and then they do a Google search on me and then they're like, Oh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, like, oh wait, wait. That's funny. You know, Mark, you're that's, also that's funny. on, you're also a board member now on blue ribbon coalition. Is that correct? I am. And it's such an honor to serve. Um, and you know, I've come to find out all these uh, different organizations that fight for public land access all kind of have a different uh, mission, you know, and, Actually, um, Blue Ribbon Coalition kind of fits me because I'm kind of the defender of public land access and, and Blue Ribbon will get down in the dirt, uh, mm -hmm. pardon the pun, and, and fight and, and uh, you know, fight for public land access. So, yeah, we just had a meeting in uh, Sand Hollow, my first time there. Amazing place. I, the, um, the, the park superintendent took me there with the park across from Sand Mountain, I guess, which is Sand Hollow. Mm -hmm and uh, showed me the dispersed camping there and they allow you know four wheel drives and side by sides to leave the, the campground and go to the uh, blm land and believe it or not that's not allowed in west virginia you're not allowed to have any type of uh, atv utv or off-road buggy even if riding properties uh, are attached to the property so that was that was wow. that's a beautiful area out there but uh, we had our meeting there and uh, it's just such a enjoyable thing to, to be with like-minded individuals and talk about how we're going to conquer the world and, and do good things. When, real quick, when I was elected to the Senate, you know that 
motorsports and finding public land access wasn't even on my radar. Now, I've been reading Peterson Four Wheel and Off Road all my life. And in the front section, I remember reading, you know, about a piece of land getting shut down with the legislator's name that was behind it, that was shutting it down. And then after I was here for a few months, I was like, hey, I can fight for land in this state. So it's been a blessing. Well, that's that's awesome to have somebody who actually is a gearhead, understands it and understands the game. And, and it's part of their own passion because many times we're trying to do that out here in California. And you got, you know, maybe the, the, the again, the old school is gone. There's a lot more politicians than there are, say, ranchers who are happy to do the job mm-hmm. or a gearhead happens to do the job or a of a of a of a you know it's like they've gone to Sac State or they went to school and they got their political science degree and then they went and worked for somebody in the Capitol and then it was their turn to run and you know and mm-hmm. God bless them all for doing what they're doing but um they're still not the guy who says I want to put an end to this you know we used to have the guys or the ranchers that went out and says ran for office just to be able to put a fight yeah. for it. it's almost like the like Yellowstone right like the Dutton Ranch mm-hmm. deciding to, to I'm gonna I'm gonna run for governor just so I can stop progress so i can stop what's going on i can actually work with people and make a change so the uh, the um i was I don't even know where i was going to go with that but well while, while <laughs> that's we're on the beauty of this show a, that's a great segue Matson, because uh i want the listeners not to be discouraged to contact the legislators no matter who they are they right. depend on these people for votes especially you need to get to know all all your listeners need to get to know what state senator represents their district and it's a little tough sometimes to find out sometimes there's two like my district has two senators represented also find out who your house of representatives state member is in west virginia we call it a house of delegates but it's different names in different states and there are usually smaller districts if you find these people you know with a little research they they will listen to you you are the you're the voters and if enough people contact them about a certain issue, if a piece of property is getting closed down, then they will listen. Come to your state capitol, get to know them in person, set up a meeting, call them, email them. I didn't realize until I got in here that we have a voice at my dad's gas station. When a car would pull in with state tags, we were like, oh no, you know, but we didn't realize, I didn't realize that I could have came to the capitol and fought like over regulation when, when my business faced it. Same goes for public land. Uh, everybody has a voice. Also get to know your um, congressional delegation, your your congressman, your U.S. senator. If there's a way to meet them, email them, call them. The squeaky wheel gets the grease. Mm-hmm. Excellent awesome. advice. Excellent advice. Now, it's interesting, um, even out here in California. So, you know, we have mm-hmm. ongoing fights. And the West has a lot more fights, obviously, for land use than we normally hear about in the East, mainly because there's not that much public lands available. Um, in most of the areas. So we're constantly fighting. We have Oceano Dunes, right? Moab constantly is coming up. Um, These are all areas where there's just a constant attention to close them down or shut them down. And in California, we do the fight for it, but the only way to to really solve it is in the courts. I mean, we have to constantly hit the courts and hit the courts hard, and then the courts put it, come in, and then they try to find a compromise. And then every, as you know, usually the compromise on one side is moving their agenda forward a little bit, and mm-hmm. our agenda losing a little bit. Like we mm-hmm. give a little, give a little. It's what's going to happen yeah. in Moab. We've already done an episode on that. Um, we're going to lose a little in Moab, but we don't lose a lot. So we're happy about that. But that becomes the game. So I'm, I'm loved to see that you're there fighting it. Now, what can, Corey's already mentioned this because you're starting to do things in, in West Virginia that will be, I think, can go across the state. But um, are you just focusing on your area? Are there things that you're doing that you're trying to, or do you have other states talking to you already about how they, how they can do the same thing? It's uh, odd that you would mention that because I was just getting ready to say the uh, California Off Highway uh, Motor Vehicle Commission is having a meeting tonight in San Luis Obispo in person, but it's also available for Zoom links. So uh, if, the, if the listeners can, uh, which this may be time sensitive, but um, anyway, I plan on joining that meeting tonight to just, uh, you know, voice my opinion. It's to do with Oceano Dunes, and I've never been there. But, you know, in my magazines, my ATV magazines back when I was in high school, I always had pictures of Pismo Beach. It's been on my bucket list for like 30 years or more, and I want to make sure that I make it there and it's still open. So uh, I've called in before, but I plan on calling in tonight. And, you know, I would like to help anyone 
across the nation if they're facing issues. I wouldn't care to uh, contact a senator or a, any legislator in another state to help them, you know, when it comes to, to land access. Well, last year, last week's episode, which was episode 201, uh, where we had a roundtable discussion, um, Ian Johnson, we were all talking about land use and what the big battles would be for 2023. And Ian Johnson made a point that SEMA should step up. SEMA has a deep war chest. But like you said, Blue Ribbon Coalition, that's been one of their fights for a long time. And I like to see that they're actually getting more and more active. In fact, uh, Corey, I don't know if you know, you know, but Shannon Welch is on the board. Oh, I did not I, know that. No, I was just, I was looking on the board because I was looking at the list because I was stalking the Senator and, uh, and saw him on there. And I looked and Shannon, she's the vice chair of the board of directors. Shannon Welch. I did not know that. Yeah. You know, and, and, and like Mark to Mark's point, I, I think, um, you know, we all talk about getting involved and doing more and, but you know, really it's, I think from, uh, again, from my perspective, it's always been, yeah, but these are people that that don't have the time. I'm just this little guy. That's always been our our kind of perspective excuse. of or excuse of it's kind of like, you know, going and talking to law enforcement when you don't have to. Like nobody mm -hmm. wants to do that. But you know what? These are people that are our friends. And as we've traveled back and forth across the country, I've I've got to know so many people, uh, law enforcement and otherwise, that are 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 or, or politicians are, are, are really, they're looking for our voice. They need it. But people are so fearful to, to get involved. It takes work. It takes time. I mean, I, I recently, we chatted about this earlier. I got some stuff from, from BRC, from Blue Ribbon Coalition. And guys need to check out their website because I thought this was one of the most creative things that I've ever seen a, a, uh, an advocate for land use do is they put out a book called the lost trails and in utah this this is pretty detailed book i mean it's got maps and images and pictures of trails that were threatened to be shut down because they're not getting used and so they put out this little book and said hey guys you want to go somewhere that nobody else is going um here's a list of trails like get out and go explore and i thought wow what a, what a great idea because we're all dealing with the, the uh, congestion, I guess, in some yes. of these heavily populated land use um, areas that are in trouble, Moab, those kind of places where there's so many people. So one of the things that I liked about West Virginia and being back East was there's so much out there that's not being explored and guys by us visiting those places and exploring them and spending, yeah, spending dollars mm -hmm. That's what helps these states fight the fight. That's what helps these politicians go to bat for us. And I, I mean, I don't know how else to say it. I, I just, there's so many places that need help and, and guys like Mark are out there fighting the fight and, and all of us in all of the states need to be contacting our own state representatives and going, hey, what can I do? I don't even, I don't, play dumb they'll be happy to get you the information. Well, yeah, and it right. comes up to, it comes up to what we talked about before, which is also guys be real, right? Yeah. You know, yeah, I'm sure Mark, not even you, you don't want to get a bunch of robo calls. You don't want to get a bunch of people sending you um, spammed email messages where it's right. just a copy and paste or a letter that's just a copy and paste, whatever out to you. You want somebody's genuine story. Right. And then it helps you to fight the fight because you can have these genuine stories to be able to do it. And the thing we did with Moab, we told everybody, get up there and just tell your genuine story. What does Moab mean to you? Why, why do you want to keep it open? Why is it important to your life, your family, your history, your future? And that's the same thing. If you really have areas that you want to keep open, tell a genuine story because that matters. It's not just about trying to shut it down or being angry because being angry and yelling, stay off my land. This is my land. I pay taxes. That doesn't work, guys. That doesn't work because it's, it happens. It just goes in one ear and out the other. So you just got to be, you have to tell your story. You have to be able to make them a partner too in your story, right? Make, make your legislators a partner in your, in what you're trying to achieve. When the environmentalists were in here, I told them about the, how therapeutic it was for me to be out in the woods, traveling on the backcountry dirt roads in my Jeep. You know, it's just something that uh, I think many could benefit from, even if they don't know about it, you know, and for them to take that away 
And, you know, we're not asking for use of the whole land. We just want our fair portion to represent our recreation, uh, you know, and just the road is all we're wanting. We don't want all each side of the road, you know, so I don't feel like it's too big of an ask. Mm -hmm. so. Yeah, no, that's good. That's good. That's good. So, okay. So you're right now, you've got several pieces of legislation that you're, um, you're sponsoring. Um, mm -hmm. And besides some great ones like, Oh, uh, parental notification of school-based dispensaries of contraceptives to minors. <laughs> Gee, like, no, nope. yeah. yeah, right. But you have a couple that are interested to our, our audience directly, which is creating the Adopt-a-Trail volunteer program for public land use under DNR jurisdiction. Um, and then, let's see, Monument Memorial Protection Act. Yeah, that's, mm -hmm. that's, that's needed. Uh, limiting liability of landowners when land is used for non-commercial recreation purposes. So I think that comes back to like what you were talking about in the video. Um, where you have these roads that have been moved onto private property. And mm -hmm. so I'm sure there's a liability issue that the landowners are concerned about, about somebody right. using that. So tell us more about that. Well, you know, we run into the problem of a road getting moved onto private property and the original public road is no longer passable because they've, uh, you know, there's a rock cliff there or something now. Then the, the after the private landowner who uses it for mining or timbering, he blocks that road access off and there's no public road and he can't access his private road. So that's a problem that I've gone to the DOH with. And there's quite a few gates just going up across West Virginia, uh, gating public roads and it's a constant fight. I've got actually one removed successfully. It was on a DNR property. There was a gate that was on a public road, um, but it's something we're working on with the DOH and had a meeting last week with them and uh, Jerry Bain and Dr. Brian Holmes have been such a great asset. And I met them both up here at different times. And uh, we've been together working for probably about five years. And uh, actually, while I'm uh, let this segue into Adventure Travel Day that we have, have planned here for February 17th. And uh, exhibitors line our um, rotunda between the House and the Senate Chamber. And it's all about adventure travel not only motorized but all forms kayaking you know mountain biking and uh, then we have a, a round table discussion afterwards with the state agency so we can let them know some of the topics of concern for us so i'm looking forward to that well, is that something that's been doing is that something you created or is that something that's it been is going something on? i created at first it was a private trail ride for legislators the first year i contacted the local jeep club the club we got them behind the bollards which are the things that come up and down out of the ground and parked around our fountain behind the Capitol Dome. And then we went on a trail ride. And then the next year we made it public and it's just grown every year. One year, uh, we, we've been having about 120 participants that come here on a Saturday. But this year, we're going to concentrate it all on the day that the legislature in the Capitol. And uh, looking forward to it. Hopefully we'll have some legislation that uh, we can put some pressure on. I, I've got a lot of pieces of legislation that I haven't dropped yet because I'm still working on uh, getting it the way that the agencies want. Uh, one of them is um, motorized access for the disabled uh, for hunting mm. purposes and wildlife viewing. And all you listeners um, think about using that term and you too, Corey, uh, to access some of this property that we aren't allowed access to now uh, is wildlife viewing. Some of this property has to be used only for uh, fishing and hunting and wildlife recreation and wildlife viewing is considered wildlife recreation. So uh, I'm hoping to, to work with the DNR and get that disabled access. Also disabled uh, access for dispersed camping on state property. There is no dispersed camping technically legal on state property in West Virginia now. So I'm at least going to get the disabled the ability to do that stuff. So two things. One for our listeners, descri describe dispersed camping so they understand it's, what that it's term basically is. basically primitive camping and dispersed means scattered about. It's not like your classic campground. You know, there's no water, no tent pad. Uh, my legislation has no ground fires because that's one of the land managers first red flags is thinking about a campfire. And if you put in the legislation, no ground fires, that kind of prevents problems down the road. And uh that's basically overlanding my legislation just to make compromises uh, with myself, not allowing ATVs or side sides or even RVs or camper trailers, but basically just to cater to the overlanding 
community, which uh, I think now is the time to do that. It, that's awesome. And on the other side of it, this is an interesting question that I, I, I don't know the answer to, but when a wilderness area is designated, right, it's nothing mechanical, which means no mountain bikes, right? Right. Mm -hmm. It's nothing mechanical. Oh, yeah. How do they apply it? So, so if a disabled person wants to go in there with a wheelchair, even though it's in many areas, it's very difficult to do, to do. Is there, is there, is there a, um, is there a way that they can do that? I mean, is, is a wheelchair considered a mechanical device that they're not allowed to use in a wilderness area? You know, if, if, a, if it's an electric wheelchair, it has a motor on it and it's motorized. So the answer is no. And it's a shame. And uh, I was actually at a U.S. reserve, uh, Federal Reserve, up near um, Timberline Ski Resort. And there was a sign there on the federal property that said, no hiking allowed. Can you believe that? No, in West hiking. Virginia, no hiking allowed. So uh, that's something we need to work on. And, you know, I didn't even think about uh, disabled access on our federal land in West Virginia, but I'm definitely going to be fighting for it on our state land. Wow. That's, that's, that's amazing. Cause you know, um, although I don't know in California, I'm not sure I'm allowed to use that term disabled. I think there's a, I'm, I'm supposed to be <laughs> what, what's the, what's the current pro politically correct term, challenged. but you know, it's amazing I'm because we do a lot of work with challenged. physically, <laughs> yeah, phys physically challenged. I know I'm mentally challenged, but there, there's a lot, we do a lot of work with, um, with groups like four wheel to heal yeah, um, and with for the wounded. And so a lot of military that have, you know, multiple limbs, um, have, they've lost limbs, they've amputees and you know, the, they get around in those little, um, multi-track little off-road rigs that you know it's pretty cool when you see them go out there and they're yeah. and some of the greatest people i've ever met greatest people i've ever met um and it's it, it, so it's to think that they can't have access to some of these areas i mean god bless you for doing that work because that you know there it's not just your average person it, 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 there's so many people that have they 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 were born with certain disabilities, or they received them in the service of their country, or in the service of their nation, or the service of their job. And each one of them, they should be able to enjoy the world that we all get to see, and we take a grant take for granted. Exactly, and talk about therapy. You know, it's therapeutic for them. You know what it's like for us to get out in the woods, but you know they need to be out there, and it's just you know healing for them. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, Okay, so I said we're going to talk about it, and we're going to jump back in. We're jumping away from Mark, the the, the legislator, to okay. Mark, the automotive enthusiast. I saw the picture of the General Lee. Tell me about that. <laughs> well, you know, I was in second grade when the show came out, which is the perfect day to start watching the Dukes of Hazard. Right, and right, right. It's it's always been. A I was fourth of grade, so yeah. Oh, there you go. Well, you remember Friday night, eight o'clock, right? That's when mm -hmm. it came on, and. Um, you know, I've loved the show all my life, and uh, me and my family went to a thing called Duke's Fest in 2005 at Bristol Motor Speedway. Oh, and awesome. my sister was there. My sister was there. And she's like, I want a General Lee. And so we worked in this deal, and uh, uh, my dad found the 69 Charger. I did all the work on it. I built it, made the replica of it, and my sister footed the bill on the parts. So it was kind of like a joint effort between all three of us. And uh, that was, we took it to Duke's Fest in 06 at Nashville, and it was a gigantic crowd. And, and uh, you know, when I was elected, you know, I knew the controversy there. And um, I didn't, didn't hide it, but um, I thought, I got a phone call one day, and uh, a newspaper says, we've received an anonymous email that you have a general lead. Are you going to take the flag off, or are you going to sell the car? And I said, neither. And I said, but it means something different to me than it does some. He said, well, what does it mean to you? And I said, let me get back with you on that. And <laughs> he gave me he gave me his email address. And I spent about an hour uh, telling in this email what the car, the flag and everything means to me. And he printed it pretty much verbatim. And uh, there was no negative uh, fallout from it. And I'm so glad that I took a stand for my show that meant a lot to me where they, you know, they prayed before they eat. Yes, ma'am. No, ma'am. Yes, sir. You know, good family values, good show. And, uh, so it's, I still have the, the general Lee and it's a special car. That yeah, was my first RC car. It was a little, little, little orange one, probably one twenty four scale little, uh, generally. Oh, yeah. And all I could do was go forward and then do the turn backwards. 
forward and turn the turn. <laughs> I remember that. <laughs> That's all you yep. do. I had that and I had the poster on the wall. It was like, oh, yeah. yeah, that was that was it. And I, I to this day, I remember the commercial that popped up where they're out in the middle of Death Valley or a big desert area, right? And you saw the General Lee, but it wasn't really General Lee. It was it was one zero instead of zero one, and it panned away, and you saw Knight Rider. Kit was there, and Michael uh, it, Michael Knight standing next to it, and it was the advertisement for the new show. Like this is a new generation. We're going to replace huh. Dukes of Hazard with <laughs> Knight Rider. That uh, was that was their their big hit. They're going to take out one and bring in their own show, and of course, it became the new thing. And um, and you know. Dukes of Hazard went through a bunch of different iterations, including the years that we shall not forget. Well, at least the one season where all the jumps were done by model cars and a little bit of dirt. Oh, spray. No, yeah, that was <laughs> yeah, terrible. Actually, uh, a that... friend of mine, Tom Sarmento, was the lead mechanic on the General Lee, and I got to know him through my general and have developed a good friendship with him. So uh, that's that's awesome. That's, cool. that's awesome. I mean, amazing. I don't even know what the final count is. Like how many General Lees they went through. They were buying every single '69 Dodger, <laughs> charge uh, Dodge Charger that they could get their hands on. It seemed it was, like it was uh, 300 and some that they destroyed. Yeah, <laughs> that's amazing, absolutely amazing. Yeah. Well, that's that's beautiful, and that just that just says you know when you gotta. I was kind of wondering if you ever like drive that to to work. <laughs> I have headed here to the Capitol. Actually, uh, I hopped the curb out in front of the uh, the big gold dome and and parked it on the sidewalk and uh, got some pictures of it. That's, that's awesome. awesome. <laughs> that's great that's great okay so you got obviously got a big agenda what's the motorsports responsibility act well sb236 our uh, it's a basically tort reform bill to uh, put responsibility on people that are making decisions for themselves and uh to take to limit the liability on a motorsports facility if you can't prove negligence naturally you know we don't want uh, a motorsports facility to just be dangerous and you know with no caution whatsoever, but it um, will help attract motorsports venues here and make it a little bit more uh, easy to operate for the current motorsports uh, venues that we currently have here. Just basically just tour reform. Nice. And then final SB 291, which I think is great. Eliminating restriction to carry firearm on state capital complex grounds. <laughs> so that's, just, that's, that's, are you, do you have a, do you have a concealed carrier or do you have a, are you a carrier? I'm a, you know, I don't carry, but I have guns and uh, I'm a believer uh, in the Second Amendment. And this bill here is fairly soft right now. There's no guns allowed anywhere on the Capitol property, inside or out. And this bill allows you to just walk diagonally across the yard, you know, if you're carrying. And uh, there is a bill that I actually signed on today that allows um, concealed carry with a permit inside the Capitol. So, uh, you know, I'm a sec second amendment guy so uh, most of the the shootings happen where a gun isn't allowed you know right. so mm -hmm. right so we just i didn't know that. i, I would have worked on my bill introduction list a little bit more <laughs> if I, i've known that i was going to get asked i've got a lot of good stuff that i haven't introduced yet so maybe we can talk well, about that well, later you tonight. know you can come on this show anytime you want and we're happy to talk about your agenda or even even get people to come out and support you because um you know this is this is the modern jeeper show about jeeps jeeping and jeep uh, jeeps jeepers and jeepings but as everybody knows we talk about everything um from our own personal mental health to uh to, to the nation's <laughs> problems i mean we we go down every path we try to I, well, I'm not allowed to be as political as I used to be because no. a few of our listeners just said, we're, we're listening to you to think about stuff that's fun, not the other stuff. So let's so stop <laughs> being so darn political. And and Corey gets on me too. I think if I had a, if I had a zapper in my chair where he could just set a little <laughs> button. That's what I need. Like, little button. Little button. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Chuck what color. are you doing? <laughs> uh, oh, that's awesome. So, uh, in fact, it's kind of funny because the, the generally still is one of my you know, my favorite rigs. And I think it's probably one of the reasons why I love the color orange and why, you know, it's just, it's just, it's still part of that same thing. In fact, I've got my little, little truck. This is the one Curtis gave me. It's right on my desk. And I was just thinking I should put a little zero one on this <laughs> yeah. and, and, and put a little gen yeah on the top. I think I should, I think I will. Yeah. <laughs> General Lee gladiator. The General Lee gladiator. I'm sure it, it's got to exist. Somebody's got already done it. I'm sure. I haven't seen one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They'll, 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 well, that's the problem. They don't want to be shot at going through South Central or something. <laughs> yeah. uh, well, hey, this has been great. Now, we do have a few little fast-paced questions at the end, um, and uh, we're going to go through this. So first off, what is your favorite trail? 
all probably cliffhanger in Moab. Oh, really? Yeah. Nice. When's the last nice. time you've been on that one? 2012. And I was in a, uh, a TJ with 37 Wranglers, bead locks, long arm, Atlas II, Dana 60s front and rear. And it was a five speed. And, you know, I'd seen stick shift vehicles on, on the obstacles before. And I thought people were just showing off. But you know what? When you hit an obstacle and you got three pedals in the floor, you can't think about it. You just have to do it. Right. <laughs> so, a lot of fun. Yeah. My, uh, uh, my, my, my first TJ, my Spike, my yellow TJ, uh, was set up very similar to what you just described. And uh, it was a five speed. And I, I've never, I never had an automatic, actually. The LJ was the first automatic I've ever owned. Mm -hmm. And um, it, people would come up and go, Oh, I had no idea you were driving a stick. How do you, what do you, I'm like, yeah, I'm a pretty busy guy in here. Um, but I, I got to where, you know, I just didn't think about it. And that seat time and that experience, heavens, I, I didn't even, I couldn't even told you if I was what gear I was in or what my feet were doing or anything. It just become so routine. Mm -hmm. But um, I, we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about um, my, my yellow TJ Spike. Yeah. It, it may be coming um, back up for availability. Nice. Yeah. Oh, yeah. really? Interesting. Yeah. So, yeah, well, our first rig out here, our TJ, Cloak One, um, which recently came from Tahoe, where it had been sitting in Aaron's garage right. back here. It's back here for a little bit. Um, that was a stick. My mm -hmm. YJ was a stick. Um, even, even Cloak Three, which is our JK, then now is a Hemi powered with an automatic and all that. That was a stick when we first got it. And I, 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 so I learned on a stick. So I love the stick, right? I love being able, obviously going uphill is more, more of a trouble. You know, there can be challenges in that going downhill, but you, you're right. You have, I think you have more control. Control. You have yeah. more yep. control of the power band and how you're applying it and what you're doing than you do with an automatic. I want to mention that TJ was my dad's at the time. And we took a family vacation, me, my dad, my mom, my sister, my daughter, and my niece. And we went wheeling in Moab, and it was such a great experience. So uh, wow. my dad, he's 84 right now, and he's got a, uh, a JKU Rubicon with a winch, and uh, and so he's still at still it. Wheeling. Yeah, that's awesome. That's great. That's great. You know what we need to do? We need to coordinate with the senator and have uh, do a modern cheaper adventure in West Virginia. I'm telling yeah. you. Yep. That would You're be, yeah, we, we, we haven't done an East Coast event, and there's too many. There's guys out there waiting for us to do an East Coast event. And we, we have this plan in Georgia, sure. but I'm saying let's start planning it now. Let's just let's just find an area to do a modern cheaper adventure in, in West Virginia. Maybe the senator can get us into some we, you know, we know some cool, folks cool yeah. place where nobody else can usually get to. You know, <laughs> absolutely. I, I can take you to any kind of terrain you want, hardcore or backcountry four roads. Yep. Perfect, perfect. Well, Senator, how do people get a hold of you? Well, um, my Senate email address is mark.maynard at wvsenate.gov. And uh, but you can search for Mark R. Maynard on all the social media and it should bring you to me. Uh, I get a little overwhelmed with messages sometimes, but uh, mm -hmm. it's enjoyable to see other uh, people seeking off-road motorized adventure across the nation. And, and I would love to be able to help them if they have an issue in their state. I can maybe direct them. Uh, to an organization or actually help them fight in their state. That's amazing. And I want to put an open invitation to you. I'm sure Corey's already done this, that you can join us in any one of our modern cheaper ventures. In fact, if you really want to see something spectacular, you know, uh, the modern cheaper venture uh, coming up in Death Valley, um, it's one of the most incredible trips you'll ever be on because not only is it an amazing area that has a lot to do about the generation of our nation. But uh, Corey and Jesse do a great job of, of talking about the history and where they go. Um, and it's incredibly educational. So, you know, grab a Jeep or even tag along with one of us flying out. We'll pick you up and, and you can be a co-dog and we'd yeah, love to have you out there. That'd be great. I also want to mention again, Adventure Travel Day here to Capitol on February mm. 17th. There's still exhibitor tables um, that are available, and it is for, you don't have to be from West Virginia, but if you are from the industry, either a retailer, manufacturer, organization, club, uh, or, and just the, the public's invited here to come and mix and mingle with all these organizations and stuff, and it'll be a good day. We're going to actually have some hardcore rigs, overlanding rigs on Capitol property here so some of the legislators can see what we do good I good so i bet you brc will be there will tread lightly be out there as well yeah tread lightly uh, scott amerman's going to be here mm -hmm. and uh 
the director also will be here and uh, actually director Ben Burr from BRC will be here. Excellent. I think Jerry right. had sent me an invite and said, yeah, you, sh you guys should fly out and, and spend the day. And I, if, if it was a little bit later in the season, we'd be out that direction, but uh, uh, yeah. Well, we're, yeah, we're early in the season, their, their, their schedule gets really loaded up in the beginning of the year. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I was just out there marking. I finally got my calendar up on the wall, and I was marking where all these spots were that, you know, like CTI, 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 CTI. Uh, well, hey, Corey and Jesse, anything else you want to um, add to the senator before we uh, before we wrap up this another amazing episode? No, I think, uh, I, again, Mark, thank you so much for taking the time. Um, you know, one of the things that, that hit me the most about at spending – spent a total of you know six days with the man uh off-road in the wilderness out of his political duties and again the knowledge that he's able to convey even um his the way everything's so articulate and and you can tell by this conversation he remembers dates he remembers places um <laughs> maybe i'm just getting older because i can't yes. do that anymore um so <laughs> we have a lot to learn from the folks who are uh, part of the system that governs us and, and is helping guide us through the country. So reach out to the folks in your own states. And if you need help, contact Mark and he can put you in touch with the people that uh, you need to be in touch with. Definitely. Okay, well said, well said. All right, Modern Jeepers, thank you for joining us for another amazing episode. Of course, you can reach me, Matt's at MetalClick.com, Corey at MetalClick.com, Jesse MetalClick.com, ModernJeeperAdventures.com, where you can register. And I believe in the next couple of days, the Moab trip will go up as far as registration. Um, there is, the seats are going like this on, on Death Valley. So, you know, don't delay. If you want to be a part of that trip, um, don't delay and be out there. I will be on the first trip. Um, I will not be on the second trip, but, uh, you know, so if all my fanboys out there, you can come join me, you know, cause yeah, I know you want right. to be out there. You want to see Madsen. This is the yeah, time. You want to see Madsen, so. you know, and, 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 and Josh, cause you probably see more pictures of him than you'd see of me coming to the first trip. Otherwise, um, uh, the, go do the second trip. If you just have, if you actually want to be relaxed and not be you know worried about a child running around all the time, uh, either way, the trips are great. So go ahead and check that out. And of course, modernjeep.com for the latest news and information about the world of jeeping and off-roading. That being said, my friends, we'll see you on the trails. Cheers. See ya. Thanks, guys. It's been an honor. <laughs>